Hello, dear audience. Today we are again with the Feast of Healthy Thoughts. We try to choose topics which will talk to our lives and will be key points in our lives. And we will also re always refer to the thoughts, the ideas that we get through our discussions. Presbyter Yaki Yaki and I will talk about the gift of being ordinary. She is especially interested in this topic and she offered the topic. I'm th very thankful because uh, this is going kind of to be continuation of the previous topic that we have discussed, the uh, topic of humility. The humility is the, one of the most important tools on our journey of spiritual life and being ordinary is kind of the continuation of that or one way of expressing our humility. Uh, thank you, Presbytera, for coming today and offering this topic. We're glad to hear your uh, explanations, and I have several questions, because being ordinary has so many nuances. It can be harmful, it can be helpful, it can support us, or it can hurt us. I want to share one little story, as I shared before, that I was present in that honoring ceremony of a person who has extraordinary achievements in this life. He has reached the peaks of career that sometimes is impossible to reach. On the other side, this person is extremely ordinary person in his relationship with his friends, with everyone. That was a very striking example before we had to discuss this topic. I would like you to introduce the idea of being ordinary. Why, first of all, why do you think we should talk about this, and then I will have my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arkadi. Hi, everyone. The idea of uh, our discussing that it is a gift of experiencing ordinariness, being ordinary, is sort of another way of looking at what does it mean to grow in humility in the presence of God. Growing in humility always, at some point in our everyday life, makes us feel ordinary and it's not a bad thing. There are times when feeling ordinary, mundane, plain, is not a good thing. And so I'm so glad you started our time together by saying that it's a nuanced issue and it's an issue that ha can be taken various ways. And that's why I thought it would be good to talk about this because there's bad ordinary, unhealthy ordinary, and good ordinary. I'm so happy you remember this example of this friend who has been a philanthropist from what I could tell and is being honored by the local community. Those were nice things to hear. As I was driving to come to the studio today, I was listening to the news and I was listening to various stories coming in of shootings occurring in, in the Boston metropolitan area of young people or other people of various ages from various neighborhoods, most of them of the working poor, where the living conditions are challenging at best, where maybe if someone from one of these contexts, or any context, we don't have to be in, from any particular neighborhood, who would hear, oh, the gift of being ordinary, you know, you try being ordinary like this for a while. And so that's the kind of ordinary we needed to look at also, where when we treat our brothers and sisters ordinary as a, in the, in the way of their being common without value. Mm -hmm. When we treat our brothers and sisters as common and without value, we do damage to them. And as Christians, we believe we do, we do damage to Christ himself. There is the story that he is very clear to his disciples that those of you who will be with me in paradise will love me, will visit me in prison, will feed me when I'm hungry, will give me water when I'm thirsty. The kind of ordinary I'm wanting us to sit with is what does it mean to share our common clayness? We are all made of specks of dust, created in the image and likeness of God. It's an amazing thing. Those are two huge concepts to think about, that we're made of clay, and somehow we are created by the infinite creator whose fingerprints <laughs> are all over us from er in every dimension of our existence. And so in our minds, I think that's impossible to contain those t each reality, never mind the two being true at once. But they're connected because that's what, that's what we are. And in order, the church has been teaching through uh, her life for us to 
and engage more honestly and truthfully our, our relationship with God, we have to acknowledge that we are not God, mm -hmm. that we are bits of clay, and that we, in, gr in gratitude, have been given an enormous gift of our creation and the love of God that's been bestowed uh, on us over and over again in various ways through the life of Christ. And so that kind of ordinariness is an adventure. I want to share with you and the audience the story written by Leo Tolstoy. It's called Father Sergi. It's about a soldier that decides to become a monk. And he is very strict in every aspect of his life. And eventually he gets a gift of healing. And he becomes a very famous monk. He overcomes all the desires of the world. But in the end, he fails. And he fails badly and he leaves the monastery and he becomes a beggar. This is the whole story. Mm -hmm. But the story shows that the person who climbs up the ladder of becoming special is endangered to fail because everybody started treating him like he was an extraordinary person and that in fact that he had overcome the worst desires and temptations in his life. He even cuts his finger to overcome the desire of a woman that visited her, him through the pain. But in the end, because he had built up this pride of being gifted with the healing, he fell. He ended his life being a gardener for one rich person in uh, Siberia, taking care of roses. So in a sense, it shows that God never left him. Mm -hmm. But he fell from the fake heights that he had reached in his life. And he became ordinary and he started serving in this, in this manner, taking care of roses. And Tolstoy says that when he, even when he was a beggar, when he was knocking at people's doors to ask for bread, he always asked if he could go in and the first thing that he was looking for inside was the library of that particular household. And in the library he was looking for one particular book, and that was the Bible. And whenever, wherever he found the Bible, he reached it, opened, read it, and explained to the household people in return for the money, uh, for the bread that they gave him. So uh, the person never left God. God never left him and he always stayed in his service, but he uh, climbed up and then climbed down maybe to the right uh, level that a human being has to be. Maybe for him, mm -hmm. in that story, that was a better life for him. Mm -hmm. And his fall, yeah, I think you're right. It was the sin of pride. You know, what is the sin of pride? The orthodox shorthand is the sin of pride is the desire for, uh, to be God without God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all of these spiritual gifts that he was given, and that he must have been the center of attention and all these people coming, it's so easy for all of us with our gifts to, to think we're special in a way that we're, we're kind of set apart and we're, no, and we're an exception to being a human being bound to one another uh, in, our, in our clayness and in our creation by the loving God. In Ephesians, we are told by St. Paul that we are members of one another. Elsewhere, he says that we are knit together. Or when one member suffers, another suffers. And so when faithful or, or persons start enjoying their gifts as ends in themselves, and that can happen to all of us. That can take us away from our truer self, which is a son or daughter, a unique son or daughter, created in the image and likeness of God. This is what it means to be ordinary, to claim and to grow in that identity. And so that he, in the story, chose, somehow became full of himself. There was a mercy occurring. God's mercy unfolded in his life and, and gave him something better at least from the way I understand the, um, the story. I, I want to backtrack a little bit and just comment on that, that phenomenon of where St. Paul talks about love. If I have the ability to, to prophesy or to, uh, or to the gift of tongues or, to, uh, or, or any, any gift and have not love, I am nothing. 
And so authentic love is sacrificial. Authentic love contains, we open ourselves to the love that God has for us that works through our own hearts with our desire to cooperate with that. And so the only way our hearts can be opened in that way is through humility. Your approach, your understanding of Christ's ordinariness, how ordinary he was when he lived on this planet. Whatever it meant to be fully human, that's what he did. He ate, he drank, he walked, he, he would ride a mule. Mm -hmm. He uh, lived with his mother or his mother lived with him. He took care of his mother. So he lived a fully human life. Uh, he was a carpenter from what we can understand. So he, on, on that level, and I really appreciate the question, he did nothing out of the ordinary. He went to the temple, he offered sacrifice. It sounds like he followed through with all of the customs of the day uh, of a, a young Jewish man uh, being faithful to the tradition. And it was only when he had turned 30, which is not young, which is in that culture, the, let's say the beginning of middle age. Uh, in our day today, to be one's 30s, to be in one's 40s, we hear often that 40 now is a new 20. And so we, we are trying to play with time. We hope. <laughs> yeah, we we're trying to play with time. And, and, and hopefully health is, is helping us uh, live vibrant lives for a, a longer time. So we can do good uh, by, by the grace of God. But in any case, it was a lengthy time of living a rather quiet life, family life with his mother, when you look at the information that we have. And so he did live, in a way, a life that was not um, extraordinary, mm -hmm. and that there are no stories from his childhood uh, up until that age, except for one, which is a, a nice story that points to his putting his life in God's service from the youngest of ages, you know, when he, um, at age 12, disappeared from the family caravan and uh, Mary and Joseph had to find him and, he's, and, and he was with the, with the priests of, of the temple, and uh, as I recall the story. And uh, they said, what are you doing, uh, son? And we were, we've been worried sick about you, you've been gone for three days. And he said, I've been doing my father's business. And what else would I be doing? You know, he's almost thinking, you know, what's wrong with you? But there's nothing extraordinary in the scriptures be outside of that story. And so that's sweet. And that's a reminder for all of us that how we structure our lives, I think, has to honor that, that dimension, very important dimension to our humanity of our lives. And, and it's so easy today with all the toys that we've been talking about in the past, all the distractions, all the really good things that need to be prioritized and all the not so good things that are trying to make their way into our priorities to cause us to be distracted, to forget this. One of the Armenian theologians speaking about how we understand Christ says, perhaps he probably talks about the Armenian church or the family of the traditional churches versus the uh, reformed churches. And he says that in our church, the divinity of Christ is more emphasized and the humanity of Christ is deemed the way. And in the Reformed churches, it's the opposite. The humanity of Christ is more emph emphasized and the divinity is not uh, so much. And it, he says this both are not healthy because when we emphasize the divinity of Christ, we separate him from us. And when we emphasize his on only his humanity, we kind of depict ourselves on him rather than uh, imitating him. And uh, so my question is going to be a little bit theological or... Could I just comment uh, on this yeah, so sure. far? Mm -hmm. Because there are various uh, members of the Orthodox family that might be listening to our conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to highlight what you're saying is, as I understand your comment, the, this Armenian theologian is talking about sort of the general knee-jerk reaction of how everyday yes. ma maybe traditionalists operate. And he's yes. also saying how everyday uh, persons, perhaps of, referring to persons of the Reformed tradition, perhaps, you know, he's not going into the depths of the theology. He's just talking no. about everyday sort everyday of life. everyday life. I just want to make that a point because sometimes uh, uh, people might think... No, he's not talking about the identifying. theology of the church. Okay, okay. He's talking about our relationship with Christ. We relate to Christ more as divine God. That's the reason that Orthodox churches have struggled so much in the early times to make sure that 
both uh, natures of Christ are clearly identified, that he's divine and human in the same time. They don't mix together, they don't divide from each other, but in the same time, he lived as an ordinary, ordinary person, even though he was a divine and he was the only begotten Son of God. Ninety percent of us out there in, in everyday life, think of theology as an academic discipline. Mm -hmm. Think about, this is what the books say, this is what the catechism says, this, these are the rules, this is the way to think about, these are the definitions. And technically, that's incorrect. I, we can fall into that very easily because we want to learn and we try to get it all down and sometimes give me the cliff notes. You, my friends hear me ask that question all the time. Give me the cliff notes quickly of what you want to tell me so that I can think about it and then we can go more deeply into the conversation. But that's dangerous because theology for us is an expression, is a way of conveying the life of God himself, is a way of connecting with the risen Lord himself. And so it is speaking for the glory of God, and that uh, the truest theology is doxology, is praise itself. Now, what does that mean? That we are all in relationship with the living God, with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also our friend. You know, and so when you're saying he was human, he is human. He is also our friend. He's one of us. Creation has been changed because of this. And so theology is not just, if we think of theology as an academic discipline only, and we need the academic discipline, we need accountability. So I'm not, I'm not against academic discipline. That's really important. But when we get stuck into the, letter, the letters on the page and confuse that with theology as just, no, these are just pointers to real theology, which is our relationship with God, our praising God with our hearts together in the presence of the angels and the saints. Mm -hmm. So, in this sense, uh, when we separate the, not separate, but kind of draw a line, this is the written theology, the dogma, and this is the life, and the life is the real theology. But when we find out that in our relationship, in real life with Christ, we relate to Him more as divine being, and we don't want Him to be next to us all the time, do we fail in our theology? Well, absolutely, because what we're doing is we're keeping Christ in our heads. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say we're worshiping God, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in, in a divine way only, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. We're fooling ourselves. <laughs> we, are, we are worshiping our concepts of God. Mm. And so, uh, but we have to be careful because that's why I said earlier about accountability in academic written theology. The Orthodox and the historical church, let's say the, the historical Christian church, which would be capital C Catholic, um, has worked very hard at articulating its faith, its credo, its what it believes. Why? Not as a definition. It's something very easy for us to slip into uh, as when, 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 uh, when times get tough or when we get distracted from thinking more peacefully and honestly with what the tradition holds, the articulating what we say, even the words, people would fight for decades over words in the creed that reflected the truth in Christ. Why? Not that the word is correct, but somehow the word is the best word we could find in our culture at the time to point us God words, to point us in that relation toward, to, for, so that we can grow in that relationship with the living God Himself. Mm -hmm. And so when we have this, when we have this sort of um, dichotomy going on between, you know, worshiping God or being one with the people, we're, we're, we, we've missed the boat. We're arguing, we might as well argue how many angels dance on the head of a pin. So they're descriptive, yes. uh, not definitive, but they're descriptive like life and death. This way, you know, <laughs> do you want the life in Christ or do you want delusion? Yes. You know, and so there were, for example, homoousios and homoousios in the creed about <laughs> is Christ like God the Father or is Christ completely God like God the Father? People argued that for centuries. And so, in the end, it was discerned prayerfully for the fullness of this life to occur. We have to affirm, we have to declare that Christ is fully God. What does that mean? Well, that means that Christ is fully God and fully human and the one person. How? It's a mystery. We, we're not, we will, we're invited to enter that mystery fully. And 
on this side of the grave, you know, we don't know, we can't figure it that out. We can just appreciate what we can appreciate and do the best we can. We went into deep theolo theological discussion, but I think it's important in our topic, uh, in 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 a way that if we understand that Christ, being God, lived on Earth as a human being and ordinary human being, then it will be much easier for us to humble ourselves. Right. And say, Sign well, me up. Sign me up for that ordinariness. Yes. I want to be ordinary in the humanity of Jesus. Christ called his disciples my friends. In different cultures, friend means different thing. In Armenian, it means somebody who eats with you, somebody who you share bread with, and it's the symbol of life. It's basically sharing your life. You can ha may have one piece of bread and then may decide you live or die and you share it with your friend. It's very intimate. Yes. In a sense, in the Oriental cultures, they say the guest belongs to God. And there has been many, many examples that the family wouldn't have enough bread for dinner, but if they had guests, they would feed their guests first and they may go hungry the rest of the day because they certainly know that the guest belongs to God. In the same way, the relationship with friend, a true friend, is the one who you would share your life with, or you would be ready to die for. Now, what does Christ mean? And what kind of relationship does he demand from his disciples as a friend? To, do, to follow likewise. Mm -hmm. To be as ordinary as he is, or to do whatever he tells them to do, uh, because if we are friends, I have some, to some extent, I feel uh, responsible to keep some standards. If I'm friends with you, mm -hmm. and I know that you, these are your standards, these are the bars for your standards, if I want to be friends with you, stay friends with you, I have to, at some extent, match those standards. I have to be that kind of person, or grow to be that kind of person but, to keep but, that friendship. But Jesus had a bad reputation once mm -hmm. he started teaching in the communities, that he used to eat with sinners mm -hmm. and prostitutes and tax collectors and all types of unclean people, and people who were seen as drunkards and, and as slothful and gluttons, and Jesus hung out with them and ate with them. So what's that mean? Good question. And what's it mean? Something. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, it means a lot that um, he identified himself with all of us, the least of us. And so if he broke bread with them, what's that say to us? In the church life, there are two opposite opinions that priest or clergy, in order to gain the people, has to be like them, to be with them everywhere be friends with them. And on the other side, too much friendliness, they say, may hurt. Now, clergy are, uh, are, are members of our society. Christ was divine, like we discussed earlier. Ben, How could his disciples do exactly the same thing without losing the, the values? Let me put in a psychological word mm -hmm. to, to make a shortcut a little bit, a good, healthy shortcut. And that is Jesus had boundaries. Okay. In, in other words, the Lord knew when he was tired. <laughs> the Lord knew he needed time to take extra care to pray and be in solitude in the presence of God the Father for, for prayer. He needed to, at times, pull away from being out in the streets with people or with all of these colorful, colorful personalities <laughs> that uh, needed his love and attention even from his own friends, his own disciples and, and followers, and he made time for himself. And so sometimes he would be alone in prayer, sometimes he would be praying just with his intimate followers, and sometimes he would pray with everyone. And so he had boundaries. It's not the issue of all or nothing. It's the issue of respecting who you are in the presence of God, the work that God has called us to do, the persons whom we are in his presence, and serve as we can, join as we can, and also take time out 
to, for restoration, to get our batteries recharged, for, and for prayer, to get, re, to get reestablished in God's presence. The Bible directs us to pray unceasingly. That's important. And so, at the same time, even so, there needs a time to be designated, and it, and it might vary with various situations and persons and disciplines, to be in one, go to one's closet, Scripture, the Lord says in, in, in one of the Gospels, and pray to God the Father in secret. That's also needed for our restoration and growth and healing. So, how do you combine two ways of being, to be ordinary and in the same time to keep the boundaries? It's good to have to have boundaries. Why? Because it is affirming our ordinariness. My husband and I th had a wonderful weekend. Uh, we were uh, in Kansas City this past weekend to be with uh, friends who were baptizing their baby. And these friends were part of a community where the, the priest and his wife of, of the parish and the assistant priest and his wife of the parish, and they were the parents of the baby that I'm the godmother of now, mm. uh, were all very, thank you, were all very, very good friends. And my husband and I took four days to do this, and we did a little bit of a crazy thing. We, we forgot we were this age range, and we did things people in their 20s would do, and we flew to St. Louis, picked up a friend. Well, five years doesn't make difference. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So, so, so we flew to St. Louis and then drove to Kansas City, so just so we could be in the in the same car with this friend from St. Louis, so we could just enjoy each other and talk, 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 and then and that person could stay longer at the at the baptism because she was going to drive, go to the baptism and come back to St. Louis. So we thought, well, if we go with her, she'll she'll be forced to stay there longer, which we know she wanted to do because she loves all of them just as much as we do, and and so we did the two days in St. Louis, two nights in St. Uh, in, in Kansas City, then drove back St. Louis, and then uh, got on the got up at you know four o'clock in the morning so we can take a. Uh, they take the first flight out of St. Louis to Boston, so we can go straight back to the seminary where I could teach. And could I could teach? Crazy, crazy. That's something someone in their twenties should be doing, not this age range. And I paid for it yesterday, mm -hmm. and that's why I was a little bit late today. But thank God everybody else was late today, so it, <laughs> God protected me. But my my point is knowing one's boundaries of energy, for example, knowing one's boundaries of how much you can give. And, and it was, yeah, we did stretch, but, we, but you know, there was a time we, we could do that all the time. And we wouldn't get the after of, oh my gosh, you know, what was that all about? And so having a boundary is reminding us that we are still clay and that I can't do this all the time. I would love, we get lots of offers. Thank you, Jesus. To, to do some things. We can't take them all on. And so to say no uh, and trust that God is in the space where no is and that God will be with the people to whom we may have to say no to painfully, whom we love, and, and, and God will direct their lives to go where they need to go next, is also part of that being ordinary, of letting go, of trusting that our other brothers and sisters are in the palm of God's hand. And it's kind of suffering when we have to say no when we'd love to say yes, and trusting God's in the process, and trusting His providence. Christ says one very powerful, but in the meantime, very ordinary saying that was present before Him, and we have been using as a society in different ways, which is the prophet is honored, but not in his own town or in his own country. Is being ordinary part of it? That if you want to be a prophet, or good prophet, or correct prophet, you have to be ordinary. And since you're ordinary, or you want or you don't, you are ordinary in your town. They know whose son and daughter you are, how you grew up, and all these nuances that make you ordinary. That's bad ordinary. Mm -hmm. That's called the sin of familiarity. Mm -hmm. Okay, the sin of familiarity is, I know you, you're so-and-so's son, so-and-so's daughter, or you went to such-and-such such a school. Uh, even about uh, the Lord Jesus, they would say, what good can come out of Nazareth? You know, that's, that's the sin of familiarity. You think you know the other person by reasons of elements that you think give you power to, to, uh, to you know, speak complete knowledge about that other person. So he was from Nazareth, what, what good can, can that be? I knew his or her mother and father or the school they came from or the degree they got. 
what what good good can they be? And so, uh, or I know the socioeconomic class they come from. What good can they be? And so all of these mindsets that we trap other people in, uh, not it's, it, we're defining them through our small mind and heart. And that's, that's the sin of familiarity. And yeah, that's the kind of ordinariness that's not of God, uh, but, but also backfires. Mm -hmm. Because the people that we malign or abuse, so if I'm in a relationship with someone who thinks they know what I am, but it's not true, uh, and no matter what I do, their hearts are hardened and frozen, and we can't, we can't, we can't grow in a relationship with each other, it does hurt me. But what happens is the person who's, who's sort of the um, protagonist in this situation actually winds up hurting more. It, does, it just doesn't hurt. And so this kind of ordinariness is, is very bad and life effacing, not life giving. It sucks life away from the, from the relationship. The relationship can go on for a long time, but it's not a good life. It might be a, a, an unhealthy energy or an unhealthy life or life effacing energy going on. Mm -hmm. Toxic energy. This was part of the reason I understand as a human being, not from the theological perspective, but if I, if I pick up the New Testament and read it, and I see Christ teaching and preaching and calling His disciples His friends and sitting with the sinners and um, tax collectors, and then He ends up dying on the cross. Do you think that that had part of part in it that when we are not ordinary, the reason for being not ordinary or pretending that we are not ordinary, we are extraordinary or we have some gifts and we are special, is to protect ourselves. And he didn't protect himself, he, he didn't want to protect himself and have fake uh, protection against around him. That's beautiful. I think another reason why I, I wanted us to talk about this today is to talk about that very fact that because we are human, because we are clay, the world is still fallen. And so we are finite, right? We are, and we are fallen. And so that, appreciating that is also in itself kind of mind-blowing. It's kind of, what does, you know, it, when people start, when we start, con uh, there are periods in our lives when if we're lucky, if we're blessed, we will think about our mortality. You know, either just a life transition occurs and we start seriously taking our, our mortality very powerfully as, as something that is going to happen, uh, or an accident happens to, to ourselves or someone we love, or an, an illness occurs to someone we love or ourselves that causes us to face our finiteness. And so it's not just finiteness, it is broken finiteness. It is a kind of finiteness where, as theologically we believe since the fall of Adam and Eve, sin and death and limitation in this way have been, in, have been introduced into the cosmos. And so that's our whole fiber of our being. And so when you talk about, you know, protecting myself, I, I think you're right. Deep down, most human beings might have some kind of a sense of this brokenness inside. You know, who am I? What is this? Where is this? And, and so that's why the gospel is amazing, because the gospel says, you know, repent, meaning turn your whole life around, turn your whole mind around, for the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning the, the reign of God, the presence of God, God's here. The love of God is saturating the universe in ways we don't understand more now than ever before. It was happening before the incarnation of Christ, Christ becoming human. And because of uh, the, the Virgin Mary, the, the mother of God, saying yes uh, to this new reality being inaugurated with the universe, that God has become human, that every fiber of materiality has been changed somehow as a result of this uh, mystery of this miracle beyond miracles. And so this is what we as traditional Christians believe. Mm -hmm. Might not make sense, but it, it's what we believe. The love of God is stronger and far more powerful than these limitations, our finiteness. It's hard, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. and so, but the news is good, it's not just good, it's great. And it's it's sometimes harder than other times to trust it because of how life is happening and life is going. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of ordinariness that's extraordinary. 
And when I have met, I've had by the grace of God, you know, my husband and I have been honored to uh, serve the church in, 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 in many countries. And we've gone to many, many countries and, uh, and met a few people that we believe, we've been told by the people, by the, let's say the church leaders that have brought us to these contexts, um, these people are holy. These people are, are, are extraordinary. They're not just, they're beyond regular, very nice people that we're blessed to know. And it's my, if I can say one thing that, that, that I could say about them is there's a luminescent ordinariness about them. I made that term up. There is like a brightness that's coming through their simple ordinariness that is beyond my understanding to articulate. And so what is it, what do these people find? Well, what they're finding is by trusting God, by becoming more themselves, by surrendering whatever our fallen ego is trying to tell us about our fake greatness, and by trusting and growing and serving and using the gifts we have in a way that give Him glory, it makes us receptive to more of God's love, and we become changed in ways we don't know how that will be, but we are changed in ways that bear Him witness and bear Him glory, and offer a, a, a presence of healing and love to others unconditionally. Do you think that being ordinary is for both ordinary people and extraordinary people? If you, if you are an extraordinary people, you have room to work on being ordinary, and um, let's say, uh, for example, you're a professor at the school and you react with your students in a such a humble way that they feel that you are being ordinary with them. But if you're a student, you cannot do anything to show your teacher that you're ordinary with him or her. You know, in, in, a, in a society contest, if somebody is ordinary can come down and be, I mean, extraordinary can come down and be ordinary. But what about the person who's already ordinary, you know, doesn't have anything special and what does, what does, have to, what does he have to do or she has to do? Part of humility means to accept the gifts that have been given to you. So the paradox of this kind of ordinariness, the luminescent ordinariness, is to enjoy the gifts God has given us, to enjoy the person God is calling us to become, to enjoy that, to say thank you, it's all a gift, be grateful. And sure, and to excelling is a good thing. We can excel and that's a gift of ordinariness. Excel in a way where we do it with gratitude, not in a way where it's to hurt others, but it's, paradoxically it's a way to serve others. At, at some point, perhaps when the students need to do well in school, they are competing. My hope is against their own selves so that they just do better and, and better to learn and grow in the way they're supposed to grow so that they can apply what they're learning in whatever discipline that might be once they leave their school. The other question I wanted to ask is, if I am already ordinary, I can strive for more and that way stay ordinary. I mean, my way of staying ordinary is to strive for more and stay the same in my relationship with, with the society. And on the other side, some person who has already reached through his or her striving, he or she is staying the same way that uh, was before. And in, in this case, what would you suggest to a person who is in the middle, is not very ordinary and is not... I think, I think I understand what you're saying and the way I've heard that expression before used with different words about in any profession, it's the persons uh, who are either the least trained or the most trained that are the most humble, in a sense, and those in the middle uh, who are the most dangerous and most nerve-wracking because, uh, so, it's, it's, so it's an interesting thing you're saying that I've heard that with different words and in different yes. ways, saying the same thing. And I don't know how many places in my own life where I fall exactly into that middle category. Mm -hmm. There might be a lot of places I fall into the ignorant, completely ignorant, or I have to say there are some things I think or people think I'm an expert on and so you know there I am on that I whatever that means so I, that's <laughs> and and every time you do I, I, I shake my head and I think oh no <laughs> help uh, and and then but I'm sure even even for myself there's there's a lot where I too fall into this in in between stage and so 
All I can say is we don't know what we don't know. That's number one, and that's a good thing. And, but for all of us to be open, that even in being ordinary, we don't know what we don't know. We ask God for help in the day to be respectful of that phenomenon. Um, when I meet someone who thinks they're an expert, and it's funny, I was on the internet uh, the other day, and I started reading something by people who think they're an expert on something that maybe they are, but I've been studying this for 30 years. So it's interesting for people who've studied it for a while, what they're saying, and I've been studying about this for 30 years, and so what they say. And they may not, they, you know, the more they, say, you know, say that I'm an expert, anybody who says I'm an expert, I'm wonderful, I'm wondering, are they really an expert or are they still like on the higher end of this middle part, which is where they're still very dangerous. But, and I'm thinking, if I were to bump into these people, uh, because some of them write about me, you know, and they make a, gross assumptions about me, which are painful. And I'm thinking, they don't know me and they say these things about me. Okay. You don't argue with a drunk. If they are really convinced that they're experts, you can't argue with a drunk. You have to let that go. That's an expression I love that I've learned from AA. Secondly, um, not everybody in that category is a drunk. You know, they are just, they don't know what they don't know. And so I believe, call me naive, I hope it's not naivete, but I think it's what I'm learning. And it's when we are striving to grow in innocence and in the wisdom of, and love of God, as God will allow us to uh, grow in, that approaching when the time comes, if I were ever to meet these people, with humility and love, mm -hmm. and an outreached, uh, uh, hands that are open and outreached, I don't know, that might be different. So I think a, a number might not be receptive. A number might joyfully say, oh, let's move on together. Uh, Presbyter, I have more questions, but I promise the audience we will continue on this topic because uh, these are important questions. And uh, I want to finish with one uh, expression that the saints always use, I'm a sinner, because they have reached the highest possible at least for them, or at the point of the time, level of sainthood, they can see the truth about themselves. And the great philosopher saying that I know one thing only, that I don't know anything. Uh, thank you very much, and I wish our audience to, um, to have that striving of learning, and never say that they don't know anything. They always should think that they just haven't learned yet. And we are all in a process of learning and that God gives us that gift of being ordinary so we don't stop learning. Thank you very much and thank you. Have a good day.